Our last and fifth speaker is Zbigniew Piecuch. He is a software developer with over 12 years of experience. For the past seven years, he worked with Agile. On a daily basis, he works as Scrum Master with a team that don't do Scrum. As strange as it might sound, this provides a lot of opportunities to learn for both him and the people in his team. Time outside of work, he devotes to, in order, order of appearance, to his family and friends, sport and movies, books and computers. Today he will talk about an agile history. Let's give a warm welcome to Zbigniew Piecuch. Hello. So that's the most difficult part, actually. Welcome, and actually congratulations to all of you, because those were like quite tough two days, a lot of interesting topic, technically challenging, and I can imagine you have, you've got your heads full of ideas, something you would like to try, or maybe just go celebrate. That's the last one. That's the last, after this, you can go celebrate, try whatever, and this will not be like very hard technical topic. And actually, there's like an agile story, an agile story that goes through agile history. So there's nothing too difficult, I think, just simply like a story I would like to tell you. But before we actually start, uh, maybe first I would like to say that whatever I present here, I think it's true right now. I may change my mind. Perhaps some of you will give me some clues, some additional information that will change my mind. For now, I think what I'm telling is true. Also, this is not any kind of training. I'm not going to be talking about uh, any particular framework, methodology. I will not try maybe, yeah, maybe a little bit, convince you to anything, start doing something, just like story. And it's rather history than history. As technical guy, I was never good from subject like history and those kind of topics. So I may have mistakes somewhere there. If you think something doesn't quite, is, isn't quite right, just check it after, let me know, yeah. Okay, so let's start. The first one is kind of a funny story. I found it really interesting. It's a story of Lake Coupe. Anyone knows the story? Except all the people that already seen the presentation. I know some of you are here. So the story of Lake Cope, as the name says, this is a this is a lake. So if you try to s find it on a map, you will not be able, because it's not there anymore. But it was in Greece. You can see Greece. Now you should see the lake there. It, it may look small on the screen, but in reality, it was quite big lake. And Greece wanted to have road there. So in order to have road there on a very big lake, you need to get rid of the, ra of the, uh, of the lake. That's natural. So yeah, but that's big lake. You cannot just take a bucket, shower 10 people, and just get rid of the water. There's quite a lot of work that needs to be organized. So there was like entire Lake Cope agency created by Greece government. And the purpose of the agency was to get rid of the water, get rid of the lake, so that there can be a road. And this happened in 1957. So this is quite a long time ago. The agency was created. They take whatever was needed, the machines, the equipment, people, and started doing the work, draining the lake. Now, let's jump a little bit ahead. And we'll get to year 2008. In 2008, something happened in the like, entire world that affected like every nation. You know what? Yes. In 2008, there was this financial crisis that, that touched like everybody. I'm not an economist, I never studied it, but I, my friend did. And when we were chatting after like 2010 or something, he said during the studies, one of the things they were taught is that countries cannot fall. Countries cannot go bankrupt. And when they have like some economical theories, formulas, I don't know, this was like something that was stated for sure, country will not fall. And based on this assumption, you can make further calculation, prepare something. Unfortunately, the financial crisis in 2008 proved this to be wrong. And there were some countries that were in so serious trouble that they were 
failed yet. So one of these countries was Greece. And in 2010, Greece was about to fall. So what do you do when you're in trouble? You search for help. You go to friends, ask for help. More or less the same Greece did. Greece went to European Union. We would need some money not to fail, just simply to still be a country. And there were discussions. And OK, we can give you the loan, but as usual, nothing's com nothing comes for free. So it was like European Union, yeah, we can give you a loan, but you need to make some promises, find some savings, resign from something. The first answer, if I'm correct, was no, 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 we prefer to stay the way we are right now. But that's like impossible, because you will only lose the money. So Greece agreed to try to search for saving, and they started. While they were searching for those savings in the year 2010, they found out several places where the savings can be made. One of them was the possibility, uh, one of them was the fact that the Copay Lake Agency is still exists, still works, still has quite a lot of people hired. They are there just after checking a few facts, turn out that the lake is not there anymore. So the main purpose of the agency was get rid of the lake. The lake is not there. The agency is still there. Trying to summarize this a little bit is that 1957, the Copay Lake Agency was created. In 2010, <coughs> sorry, in 2010, the agency still exists, but there is no lake. And here's a small quiz for you. How do you think? Which, what year was the Lake Copay actually drained and there was no water at all? Okay, so seven to two, one of the propositions. Also a good proposition. You can prepare the answer in your head. But the fact is that actually the, the lake was drained in 1957. So the same year the agency was created, they managed to get rid of the lake. The road is there for many years already. The agency is still there. 53 years of doing, not sure. Imagine 53 years is like grandpa, father, and son was working there. Imagine what. I'm guessing that the people that were working still there were all the piece of people in the office preparing some papers. I don't know what they were doing. Like, you come to work, hey, go check the lake, okay. Still dry, write the report. It goes to the president. Phew, it's still dry. 53 years of, the, of this kind of work, I'm just guessing. This is the fact that I found really amazing, that for 53 years, a big agency could be working and doing I don't know what. Okay, now let's jump a little bit uh, to the proper topic of this discussion. It's agile history. Story about agile history, maybe this way. And how it all started. So various people have given various answers. The one that I've heard previous year here on a Code Dive conference during a talk called is your Agile Agile was that actually the Agile thing started, was started by those guys. I mean, not those actors that are there on the picture, but you can recognize, I think, Spartans. It's way before Christ. Spartans were very good warriors, but they have their way of fighting. They've got, had the shield, the spear, standing in a formation, and actually the formation was the big power of their way of fighting. One soldier with the shield was shielding not only himself, but part of the soldier that's standing on the left. And with this formation, for many years, they were winning like a lot of battles. But finally, at some point, there was a tribe that figured out a way how to break the formation. And actually, from that moment, they started to realize that if you've got prepared plan and just go with the plan, you may hit a wall quite quickly. Someone who can prepare something, or there will be something in the reality that will not allow you to execute the plan. And they realized that they need to observe what's happening 
and based on this observation, react to what's happening on the battlefield, react and counteract what, what the opponent is doing, what your enemy is doing. <coughs> Sorry, what your enemy is doing. This is, uh, based on this, more or less, there is something called OODA loop created. Observe, orient, decide, act. That's used nowadays by some organization and mostly by military, I think. But that's how it pro possibly started thousands of years ago. But what I would like to talk is something that's much closer to us. Something that's called PDCA loop. Plan, do, check, act. This loop was invented, proposed in 1930s or even a little bit earlier by Deming. I mean, books and some places in internet claim that this was proposed by Deming. Deming itself claims that this was proposed by uh, Shevard. Because Deming says this one is wrong, it should be actually be PDSA loop, plan, do, study, act. Nice look, nice loop. Probably the picture looks great, but that's not like the most important part. The most important part in the idea of Deming was to was about incorporating quality assurance into the process, so that you will not create something and when it's done you check whether it fits all the requirements, but you do the checking uh, while actually producing it, while the process is running. And doing this, correcting the process, and with time creating more and more reliable and better things without even the need for the checking at the very end. This was the idea of Deming in 1930s. And in 1930s, like almost every corporation, used the way of working that you've, you had people that were doing the work, and people that were organizing the work. And some even will say that it is not good for those two guys to talk with each other. Those people that are organizing the work are able to gather, gather data they need, and based on it, prepare the flow, prepare the flow process, prepare the machines, and the people that are doing the work will only do it. They don't even need to talk to each other. Most of the companies work this way. And imagine now Deming coming to any organization and say to the boss director that was running the company for tens of years or has is in the family for a longer time and telling him, you know, you need to resign from the way you're doing it right now. You will get benefits, but you need to allow the people to decide. You will not decide anymore. It's like most of the guys would tell him crazy. Deming idea looked good on paper during studies, but putting it into real life, going to companies, even nowadays can be difficult. And like 100 years ago, it was not doable. So what happened? I think history helped here. Because in 1939, something happened. Probably, probably we all know what. It's like the start of the Second World War. It possibly wasn't World War in 1939, but it started. The next day that, was in, that is important here is 1941. In 1941, a lot of things happened, but the thing I've got in my mind is that Pearl Harbor was attacked, and this is uh, the year when officially United States of Amer America joined the war, and pro possibly then it became a world war. But anyway, they joined. And when you join, you need a lot of resources to take part in such big campaigns. You need a lot of stuff. So despite the fact America is rich, there was missing like everything. Those are the time, just to try to explain how bad times were those war in America. There, for example, such posters uh, displayed by the government. The government try to convince people to eat less so that they could give it to army. Uh, this was the, the years when government prepared like entire campaign for the people to convince people to eat meat leftovers, something like livers, hearts. This was previously not eaten by people. They just go to rubbish or animals were eating it. But to have more meat to be able to send it to the soldiers on the front line, People in USA also have to eat something. So there were like big campaigns. I'm just 
telling this because I'm trying to make you think how bad times those were actually. And in those bad times, you cannot afford to have wastes, you cannot afford to have bad quality. There was also uh, a group of people organized by uh, US government that was supposed to help uh, factories, help organizations produce better, faster, and uh, with better quality, mostly weapon or cars or everything that's needed on the front line. And Deming was quite important part of that uh, committee. And this is the moment when actually the history helped with this PDCA cycle. Because normally, no one, normally people would not take it into account and change the way they are working. But because of those tough times and because it was kind of uh, enforced by US government, companies started working this way. And this PDCA star cycle actually started to be used. Um, good for us, perhaps not, for, not so good for Deming, in year 1945, the Second World War finished. And again, to imagine, it looked, I'm assuming it looked more or less like this. Not in USA, uh, but in Europe, for example. And when, you've when everything looks like this, you need everything. You need uh, people, you don't have factories to start create metal, for example, and start building buildings. You need everything and you don't have it. So you import it. And where can you take it from? After the war, it was mainly from USA. And like Europe was taking everything because everything was needed. And there was big stream of stuff flowing from USA to Europe. But when you are a producer and you've got clients that are taking everything, why should you care about the quality of the stuff or pay extra to improve your process or anything? This doesn't make sense. Whatever you produce, they will take it anyway and they will pay you. So possibly because of that, Deming kind of lost his job. The idea for the constant improvement was abandoned. It was just simply not required. So, Deming lost his job, but from the other side, the same problem were in Japan. Japan, however, realized the possibility that uh, the idea from Deming gives, and they invited Deming. So in 1947, he moved to, J to Japan, and he started to explaining and introducing his idea for uh, increasing quality for the for the cycle, how the processes can be improved, constantly improved, started to be uh, implemented in Japan. More or less we know how, we, how it ends. Japan was seen as the country that has very good quality, that produces very good quality stuff. And it was such success that Deming in 1960 was ordered with one of the highest national order by Japan Prime Minister. Okay, now let's jump a little bit just after I will drink water, and we get to year 1980. 1980 is a very special year because that's the first year when the PDCA cycle loop was used in Poland. That's the year when my parents looked at my older brothers and stated, let's improve, now you have to listen to me. That was supposed to be a joke. Okay, let's move. So, uh, Numi Film Factory. New unified, new unified Motor Manufacturing Incorporated factory in USA. Opened in 1960 by General Motor and unfortunately closed in 1982. But two years later, reopened by Toyota and General Motors. When reopening, they've hired like over like over 2,000 people. Over 85% of the people were the same people that were working previously in the company. When the, the company, when the factory was open first time, they had to close because of the low quality of stuff being produced. 
and because of the problems that there were between employees and uh, the organization. When they opened it again in 1984, within several years, that factory became one of the best factory in USA. So what actually changed? When the factory was first running, it was running, it was been run according to the old ways. The factory was producing cars, the production line may not stop. This is something that was told to the guy that were working them, that were working there. So when the cars car were going on the production line and there was some problem with the car, some defect, they just marked it. And the car went through the production line and has been assembled till the very end. And when the car was like ready entirely and could, go, could be sold, they knew this one car is broken, they put it aside, have to disassemble it entirely, fix the small part that was broken, assemble again. Imagine if the problem was detected at the very beginning of the line. Imagine all the costs that the car was done till the end and disassembled assembled back. The people were told that every minute of the production line when it's standing, it cost $15,000. Uh, and in 1960, this was much more money than it is right now. And there are even cases, there is, a, I think, one case noticed when one of the guys standing uh, by the line fainted and just fell down. And no one actually knew what, what's happening, but no of the other colleagues ran to help that guy because they were so, I don't know how to say it, trained or something that the line cannot stop, they need to work. It took several minutes before some manager came and they helped the guy. The guy survived, there was nothing serious, but... The entire idea that you imagine you're working, your colleague is fainting, lying on the floor, and oh, I cannot stop working. I'm continuing working. This was the way how it, the job was organized there. This is probably the reason why the demotivation of the employees were very high. That's, there are stories uh, from the guys that are working there that when those cows were, were going on the production line, one guy was, for example, putting uh, paper cups, next one was filling with whiskey, and then the entire line could drink during the work. And this wasn't something uncommon in that factory. One of the guys working there was Rick Madrid. After the, the factory was reopened, in, uh, not after, during reopening the factory in 1984, he was one of the employees that was being hired back. So he had the interview and he was asked what was the thing that you didn't like in the factory previously when you were working there? And his answer was, the biggest annoy annoying thing was that people had ideas, people were proposing how to improve the process, how to improve the small things, and no one was listening to them. No one wanted to take this into account. There were some other guys that were planning, whatever they planned had to be done, and that's it. Maybe because of this, this answer, he was hired back. However, when Toyota planned to open the factory back, they said, we'll open it, but the factory has to work according to our philosophy, according to how our factories in Japan work. So he was told, yeah, we will hire you back. You'll be like, not like regular employee, but some kind of leader, have some people that you will be working with, but you need to go for some time to Japan to learn our way. So Rick, went to Japan, and while learning there, he had the possibility to walk wherever he wanted in the factory just to observe. During one of the, his observations, he saw a scene that one of the guys is uh, sc screwing, some uh, screwing some two parts, and the screw broke. The guy pulled a line that was above his head and continued working till his, the end of his position, where the entire production line stopped. It was the moment he thought, oh yeah, now you're in trouble. And a few, few moments after, one of the manager coordinator is coming to that guy, and now you're in trouble. And the coordinator only comes to the, to the worker and does something like this, and the worker is saying something to the coordinator, not the other way around. After translating it, it turns out that the guy was saying, why are you giving me such low quality elements? Why are you not caring about the work I do? So it kind of looks, it's not the manager coordinator having uh, hmm, 
screaming at the worker, but the worker screams at the co coordinator. This was the moment when in Rick heads there was like mind shift, when he realized it should be the other way around. Those are the people that are working there, know what they should be doing and how it should be done. When he got back to USA and the factory was opened, they also had the line above their head, which was called, I think, undo line, that can stop the entire line. However, no one in the factory wanted to use it. Up till a moment when uh, the director of Toyota was there in the US uh, factory and one of the guys had problems. By accident, the director was quite near. So the guy is trying to fix it, the line is going. The director came and said, just pull the underline. No, no, I will manage. No, no, just pull the underline. No, no, I will manage and the line is going. And the director took the hand of the guy, put on the line and pull it. After that accident, all the rest of the crew realized it's allowed to be done. No one will have problems because of that. And it was not uncommon that the underline was pulled like hundreds times a day. And despite all those small breaks in the work, the factory improved so much that within, I don't remember the precise date, uh, date right now, within several years, that factory became one of the best factory in USA. Uh, why I'm s telling you this story? Because I think this story very nicely represents the mind shift that needs to happen in mind of the both the people that are working and the people that are organizing the work. Something that is seriously very difficult. Okay, uh, maybe someone will be interested that that factory since 2010 is known as te uh, Tesla factory. Okay, but going to something we know a little bit more, to Agile Manifesto, to software development. So, the Agile Manifesto was created, uh, was created in 2001. And for some people, this is the moment when the entire movement started or when it actually started, but it's really, the f really true. Because, as far as I'm aware, the problems, the, it all started with something called software crisis. The software crisis was in 1990s or maybe even 1980s. And the crisis was that producing software took at least three years. And in some, uh, some, uh, for, some, um, yeah, for some categories like aerospace, it could take even 20 years. Imagine you would like to order a software that you need. You go to a company that is producing the software. They tell you, yeah, yeah, sure, we can do it. You will have it in five, year times, in, a, in five years. In five years, you can change your business. You can start doing something else. In five years, most probably regulation will change. You don't need the software very likely after five years. And what about 20 years? To deal with this kind of problems, there are various movements started. And for example, uh, dynamic system data management, I think, was started in 1994. In 1995, Scrum was codified. It's not that they started using it, they wanted to present it on a conference, so they had to write it down, the rules. The Scrum there was slightly different than we have right now because it evolved since then. It's like 25 years ago, uh, 24 year, years ago. However, it happened there. Extreme programming, also 1995. And there were various other methodologies that people were actually using just on s rather small scale in, this, in their companies. So what happened in 2001? After 2001, when the Agile Manifesto was created and presented to people, it actually it only made the entire movement to speed up. Since that moment, or a little bit later, there was like a lot of various frameworks invented, organizations, uh, conferences, a lot of trainers, a lot of uh, blogs, a lot of uh, videos, a lot of a lot of stuff that you could take and all of them are, say, agile, agile, agile. All of them are doing slightly differently. And I'm interested in those subjects. I'm not able to follow it. And now 
This is the stuff that should help actually people deliver value thing to, the, um, to their clients. And how someone who is mainly focused on software development could follow all of this. That's like impossible. People that are interested in it have problems in following it. And how from all of those information, from all of those framework methodologies, pick something that you would like. That's seriously big, uh, big problem. So what's actually important in all of this? And I would like to say that what's important in this entire thing is to make the cycle, the PDCA cycle start to move. Not to only plan do, plan do, plan do, but to add those check and act. And how, what's the simplest method to try to do it? Whether you're like Scrum Master developer, whoever, how could, how could we start doing it? And the simple thing is just start asking question. Why we are doing this? How will it implement, how will it help us? How will it help our client? Why we are doing it this way, not the other way? Challenge the current solution. There are various problems with asking questions because you need to be feel secure if you ask the question, so that no one will just start screaming at you, why are you laugh asking at all, just, uh, just start doing it. And this is something that actually also can rise in the organization by starting asking questions, maybe little, seriously small ones, but slowly asking those questions from various signs can help change them, make the mind shift in other people in the organization. There are some problems that I think I've met why people don't want to give the questions. And one of them is, oh sorry, I'm new. So people sometimes come to our organization and they don't ask us, I've just joined, I, I will wait, I will learn, then maybe I will ask. But if you think about this, such if you're actually new somewhere, You've got the unique, possib unique opportunity to see the things differently because people get used to things. When they are somewhere, work somewhere for some time, several years, stuff that for someone outside looks strange, for them it's natural. So being new can be an advantage actually here. And even if someone will give you the answer straight away and it makes sense and reasonable, then you will just know the answer. You will not be bothered in your head but further by the question. The second thing is that, well, they are working on the problem for a long time. It's probably nothing new. Someone was thinking about this. I will not raise this. There's a story of a guy called George Price that he had some health issues, after which he got quite some money that allowed him to not work anymore, just live. So he took the money, moved from USA to England, and just do his hobby there. His hobby was actually uh, genetics. So he was reading various papers, and based on those papers, he prepared some formula. He thought, yeah, that's quite a nice formula. But it got him interested, and he thought, what father could, could I do with, that, with this? So when he was in London, he went to London University, found a professor that was doing lectures and work on genetics, show it to the professor and ask where he can find, find more information about it, when he can find something more, some up, um, how to apply it. Turned out that no one thought about this kind of, of formula previously. He was the same day hired by the London University as a professor and started working them. And it was something that, yeah, he was also thinking, probably it's there, everybody knows, this cannot be difficult, because, well, it was quite obvious to me, but sometimes something obvious to one person may not be obvious to, to others. Starting the discussion, starting to ask questions, can lead to really nice uh, results. And the last reason I would like to mention here is that people are not sure if what they what they are thinking about makes sense. They are not maybe ready yet. They think, 
yeah, I've got some idea, but I need to think on it, work on it. When it's prepared, ready, I've got the entire reasoning, then I can share with others. But that also might be not true. There is a, a beaver and hare story. So there was a hare and beaver talking to each other, and they were doing it near the Hoover Dam. And you know, we know that beaver builds dam. So at some point, the hare says, whoa, that's seriously impressive, the dam. And the beaver says, yeah, but I didn't build it. But it is based on my idea. So even if you have something that doesn't look big yet, maybe if you start discussing with other, it will just simply raise and there will be something great can come out of that. OK. So starting giving question can help you change the organization, can help you in your work, can bring more sense in what you are doing. And actually, we should start giving question just to make sure that nothing in our company is like the Lake Copay Agency, just there to be there because it was there for thousands of years or dozens of years. Just start giving question. Okay, and that would be it I have. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I may try to answer.